Now who's ready to piss off the internet today? Is me. Because today's video is one that has a lot of controversy because you're gonna get different answers from different people that you ask literally all across the world. So I've been asked this for months and I, I'm not gonna say I've been avoiding the video but it hasn't been at the top of my list. Today we're gonna talk about engine break-in and the way that you should be breaking in an engine. Now like I said, it's controversial. You're gonna get different answers from different people that you talk to. For me, this is the exact process I follow, which we're gonna go through here in a little bit. Uh, we're gonna talk about some common myths that I've seen, and then uh, we're also gonna take my car out, go drive it a little bit, and I'll show you some of the techniques of what we're gonna be talking about in this video since we're technically still breaking in this engine behind me. So, one of the biggest questions I see is how many miles should you put on an engine before break-in? I'm gonna tell you this, whoever built your motor, follow their recommendations if you don't know what you're doing. If you want to venture outside of what your builder is telling you to do you can follow my steps if you'd like so typically you're gonna see people tell you uh, engine braking needs 500 miles a thousand miles 1500 miles 2,000 miles 3,000 miles all these wild wild answers out there that's just that's just not true you're also gonna hear people say I, people have asked me this too and it always throws me, throws me through a loop is how do I break in my bearings for we're gonna start with that we're gonna start there hey you don't break in your bearings like there's nothing you can do to break in your bearings. Like after you have measured out your engine, you've made sure that all your clearances are good, you've made sure all your tolerances are within spec, there's nothing else you do with the bearings. Like you, there's no breaking in the bearings. Your bearing and crankshaft should never have metal to metal contact. And if you're having metal to metal contact between your crankshaft and your bearing, you are going to have some more catastrophic issues in worrying about breaking in an engine. There should always be a very thin film of oil between the bearing and the crankshaft. That's what the crankshaft actually rides on is the oil. That's why when you go to measure out an engine, you know that you're gonna be using this grade of oil. Your oil pressure is probably gonna be somewhere in this range. With those factors, you know these clearances should be X, Y, or Z for whatever your engine you're building is. Now, based off of knowing that information, you know that once that engine sees oil pressure, that very, very small clearance of a couple thousandths of an inch is gonna fill up with oil, and that is actually what the crankshaft rides on. That's why you put engine assembly lubrication on everything when you go to build a motor. If you did not put any type of lubrication on an engine you're building, and you go to start it, you're gonna have a very bad time because you're not gonna have anything protecting the bearing or the crankshaft from riding on each other because as metals heat up, they expand and they're gonna expand a couple thou. And if you don't have anything there to A, lubricate it and B, cool it off because yes, the oil does help pull heat out of the engine, you're gonna have a bad time. So breaking in your bearings, you, you don't have to do any, there's nothing you do to break an engine bearing. Now the big thing that you do want to make sure, it, I don't even call it breaking in, but it's bedding. You're gonna wanna bed the piston rings to the cylinder wall. Now that is something that I slightly messed up on with this engine just because of the whole tuning aspect of things, how long it took to get it started, things like that. Personally, I'm not worried about the engine behind me. I know it's going to run just fine. I know everything about this engine is Gucci. So what you're doing is when you hold up actually I've got a piston right here now what you're gonna be doing is bedding in the rings on this piston the very bottom one is gonna be your oil control ring the other two one of them is gonna be your oil scraper ring the other one's gonna be your compression ring now contrary to popular belief the piston ring doesn't seal with outward force of just the ring itself because if you guys can see here these rings move a little bit and that isn't actually what's creating the seal between the piston ring and the cylinder wall what it is is as the piston comes up you get the mini explosion right here you've got all those compression gases here they're going to push back down on this piston and what that's going to do is it's going to push down on this ring and that's what's going to seal the piston ring to the cylinder wall of your engine then thus creating the seal now, if you get a weak or a bad seal between the piston ring and the cylinder wall, what's going to happen is you're going to have increased blow-by. If you don't know what that is, it's excess oil that's going to make its way past the rings. It's going to, well, it's going to go from the crankcase, past the rings, into the combustion chamber, out of the valves, you're going to be burning a little bit of oil. Um, it's not the end of the world if you have a little bit of blow-by, but you can prevent a lot of it by doing the break-in process properly. And we're going to get into my break-in process here soon. I just want to cover these basics first. Now, with that, you're also going to see a very small decrease in the amount of power you could potentially make because if you're not sealing your rings properly you're also losing a little bit of those compression gases if you're losing a little bit of those compression gases obviously the engine's not going to make as much power as it could if it was bedded 100% properly so we've kind of covered the basics there of um, what you're actually bedding in the thing about bearing breaking in bearings you don't got to break in bearings bearings shouldn't have to be broken in 
Going through the engine braking process, there's a couple things that you need to do before you even start the engine. A, when you get your engine assembled, make sure that, like I said, make sure all your clearances are good, make sure all your tolerances are good, measure eight times, assemble once. Make sure you've got a good quality assembly lubrication put on any moving components, any bearings, any journals, anything like that in that engine that is going to see movement. If you don't have an engine assembly lube, um, you can use a high quality oil. I would probably go with the assembly lube though because it's more geared towards obviously engine assembly. So after you've gotten that, you've got your engine back in your car, you've got everything ready to go, you're ready to start it. Before you even start the car, you need to prime the oiling system. What that is going to do, especially if you have replaced your oil pump recently, you're not gonna have any oil in that pump to prime the system. So what you're gonna have to do is disconnect the fuel pump, whether that's pulling the fuse, unplugging it, um, anything like that to make sure that no fuel is getting up into those injectors because it is going to try to inject fuel if you're trying to prime the oil pump and you don't want to flood your cylinders with a whole bunch of gas like you don't don't do that once you've got the fuel taken care of you also need to disconnect your crank position sensor that's just going to help keep the engine from not starting you don't want it to be able to start when you're priming this stuff lastly take out the spark plugs from your engine with the spark plugs in there and no fuel and you're trying to turn it over, the engine's going to have a more difficult time to turn over because all of that compression is trying to stay inside of the engine, which is obviously what you want. But whenever you go to prime the oiling system, you want no, you want to keep as much load off the engine as you can. Removing those spark plugs is going to allow the engine to spin a lot faster to enable you to build oil pressure quicker. And it's also going to help make sure that you're not putting any stupid types of load on these piston rings when you go to start. So you've got your spark plugs out, you've got your fuel disconnected, you've got crank position sensor disconnected. Awesome. Get in the car, Keep turning it over. I recommend having a mechanical oil pressure gauge hooked up to one of the oil galleys on your engine so that way you can physically see, hey, I've got oil pressure. I know I have oil pressure. I can see it right here. If you don't have a mechanical oil pressure gauge and you are turbocharged, what you can do is pop off the oil feed line for the turbo, put it in a glass jar, put it in some type of container so that way when oil starts coming out of that oil feed line, you know you have oil pressure going through the engine. Last case, if you don't have that and you don't have a mechanical gauge but you do have a dummy light on your dash, you can continue to turn it over until the dummy light on the dash turns off. Those are three ways to verify that you do have oil pressure. So, got oil pressure, fantastic. Pop those spark plugs back in, reconnect your fuel stuff, plug back in that crank position sensor. Make sure you're topped off with fluids. I don't recommend starting your engine with no coolant in it, anything like that. Don't do that. So you got fluids in there, you're ready to go. Let's say that you've got brand new camshafts in the car because when you go to break in an engine, you're going to have to do a camshaft break in process. With all of the cams that you're buying from the manufacturer, you should get something called a cam card. The cam card's going to tell you like the duration of the cam, the degree of the cam, the valve lash that you're supposed to set between the valves and, or your valve buckets or your tappets, your lifters, whatever you have, and the cam itself, as well as your cam break-in process. Now, typically for your cam break-in process, you're gonna start the car, you're gonna obviously let it idle for a second to figure out what the hell's going on with it. Assuming that you have no leaks also, before you start doing any of this other stuff, make sure you have no no, like oil leaks, coolant leaks, fuel leaks, anything like that. That's like worst thing. Typically for cam brake and process, you're gonna rev the car up between two and 3,000, oscillating that RPM in that range for about 20 minutes or so, and that's going to help break in those cams. So you've got your cams broken in. Fantastic. I totally skipped over putting oil in the car. Ha! First oil change that you do, or the first oil that you put in your car, go buy cheap conventional oil. Because you're gonna do an oil change literally right after you do this cam break-in and whatnot. Conventional oil in, you're breaking in your cams, cam break-in is done, fantastic. Now, it's been about 20 minutes. I personally shut the car off, I get that old conventional oil out of there. By getting that old conventional oil out of there, you're grabbing any of that crap old assembly lube that might still be floating around the engine, you're getting out any material that may have come loose, you're getting out anything that might still be in that engine. So get it out of there before you even go drive the car. So. Old oil is out, time for new oil. What do you use? If you have a builder and you have like a full sheet from them, follow whatever instructions they give you for what oil to use. Personally, I like to use engine break-in oil. Um, it's what I've always used. I use Modal 10W40 mineral break-in oil. Break-in oil is gonna have more 
protection for a brand new engine when you are breaking it in. That's gonna be more zinc and more phosphorus in this oil than you would in normal oils. Um, they took, they started taking zinc out of oils a couple of years ago, I wanna say. So getting a specific break-in oil is what you want. You want a mineral, let me, let me specify, you want a mineral oil for your break-in. The grade of the oil is totally gonna to depend on the engine that you're using and the engine that you have. If you have any questions about what engine oil you should use or what engine oil you should run in your car, ask somebody who's experienced in the platform that you're working with so that way you are putting in the right oil this is a very tedious process when you're breaking in a brand new engine because it's going to set the engine up for the rest of its life it could last X amount of miles it could last Y amount of Z amount of Y who, who knows who knows how long it's gonna last you got your fresh oil back in the car it is time to start getting some miles on this bad boy now here's what I was talking about earlier there is a misconception that people say you need 500 miles 1,000 miles 1,500 miles 2,000 miles 3,000 miles to fully break in an engine. A long time ago, yeah, it probably would take that long, but with how far things have come with cylinder honing and piston ring technology, it really doesn't take that long. Typically, you're gonna break in an engine in the first like 100 miles that you're driving it. After that, you're not gonna see much more break in than you're already gonna have. What you're doing when it comes to seating or bedding the piston ring to the cylinder wall is you've got a fresh hone on that cylinder wall. That fresh hone has a specific roughness value. I don't know what it is off the top of my head because it's going to vary from car to car, but it's going to have a roughness value. So as that piston ring is moving up and down the engine, it's also going to be spinning a little bit. What you're doing is you're seating or you're bedding that piston ring into that fresh hone and that roughness, it's going to create a memory type of effect on the cylinder wall. So that way that piston and that piston ring is going to create a seal and you want the best seal possible. Now I wouldn't suggest just letting the car idle for long periods of time like I did with mine. Um, I didn't really have much of a choice because we were fighting a lot of issues, fighting a lot of problems. So don't do what I did with this car. What you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wa wanna start putting light load on the car. And I'm not talking about going out smashing on your car 100% full throttle, anything like that. Light load, you're gonna wanna start to put load on that. Like I said, the combustion gases from the engine are going to push down on that piston ring and help expand it to create that seal on the cylinder walls. That fresh hone that you have in there, it doesn't last that long. Once that fresh hone is gone, that's all the bedding that you're gonna get from that piston ring on that cylinder wall. For me, what I do, the first 50 miles of driving the car, I will stay out of boost, I will stay under about 30% throttle, and I will drive the car normally. You don't wanna hammer on the car, you don't wanna beat on the car, you don't wanna do anything like that. After that first 50 miles, you do not have to do this, but I do. I change the oil at 50 miles to get out any residual assembly lubricant or anything else that might be floating around that engine to get it out of there, because the last thing that you want is a piece of material getting under one of your bearings and completely destroying your life. Like I said, you want no metal to metal contact between anything on the crankshaft side of things. And if a piece of debris that may have been in that engine when you were assembling it makes its way through an oil galley and potentially gets under one of those bearings or through an oil galley and like in between something, even if it's between the camshaft and the head, you're gonna have a bad time. So after 50 miles, I'll change out that old break-in oil that I had in the car and I'll put a fresh so a fresh set. I'll refill it with break-in oil again. Now I'll run that next set of break-in oil from 50 miles up to 250 miles. Now, that oil, after 250 miles, I go back to normal oil. So, between 50 miles and about 100 to 125 miles, I'll get into a little bit heavier of load with the car. I'm talking maybe 30 to 50% throttle, no 100% pulls, no watt, nothing like that. That's going to put a little bit more load on those piston rings to help them seal a little bit more. From 125 miles to about 250 miles, I'll start to get into boost a little bit. I'm, ta I'm not talking a lot. I'm talking maybe, maybe like five to seven PSI. And that's totally gonna depend on the turbo setup in the car that you have. Five to seven PSI on a 6870 like this is totally gonna be different than five to seven PSI on like a VF48 or a VF52 that you're gonna find in like a normal Subaru. Putting that extra load on the piston rings is going to help them seal on that cylinder wall. Ideally, you're gonna have your, your piston rings fully bedded to the cylinder walls between like 100 to like 150 miles max. That's max, max right there. It happens pretty quick. And after I get past that 250 mile point, I just do 250 miles for good measure. Um, after that 250 mile point, I'll full send the car and I'll drive it like I normally would. After you've already done the bedding process and your engine is broken in for what you define it as, it's all downhill from there for your engine. It's not gonna get any better. If we're being honest here, it's not gonna get any better. It's not gonna wake up one day and be like, wow, I feel like a brand new engine again. I'm gonna rebed my rings. I woke up, I'm just gonna start it and rebed them. 
It's not how it works. After the piston rings have bedded, that's all you got. Like from there, it's all downhill. So, and I totally skipped past this, which we're gonna, which we're about to go do when we go drive this thing. Um, vacuum on the piston rings, if you can do that. I'm talking when you're driving, give it some gas. It's essentially use engine braking to slow the car down versus using your brakes. Use engine braking whenever you can because that extra vacuum that you're putting on these is definitely going to help seal those piston rings even more to that cylinder wall. So while you're driving the car, engine braking, it's gonna be your best friend. So. Let's go drive this thing around a little bit. I'll show you guys uh, engine brake in. And for RPM limiting, obviously, um, use common sense for what RPMs you should stay under. For me, I try to stay under about 4,500 RPM. So let's go drive this thing a little bit. I'll show you guys what I'm talking about, the engine braking thing, um, the RPM limiters, things like that. Like I could go on and on and on about engine braking for like two hours if I really wanted to, but I'm trying to keep things ready at like 17 minutes. So I'm trying to keep things condensed a little bit. Alright you guys, so that is all I've got for you guys on this one. If you feel like this video helped you, go ahead and hit that like button. Turn it black, blue, green, yellow, purple, silver sign, whatever color it turns for you. And if you think that there's anything major I missed, if you think I'm totally inaccurate, if you think I'm stupid, if you think I'm dumb, go ahead, let me know down below. I don't care, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep breaking in my engines this way because it's been successful for me in the past for multiple, multiple engines. That's how I break them in. Does fine. You don't need 3K miles to break in an engine. So, with that, that's all I got for you guys on this one. If you guys want to subscribe to the channel, you know what to do. I'll put it in one of these corners. Go ahead and hit that button if you're feeling up to it. But, with that, I'll catch you guys in the next one. So, peace out, homies.